All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming along to the session on privacy and online business. My name is um, Simon Young, and there are a number of Simon Youngs in the internet in New Zealand, and I'm but one, and perhaps not the one you think of. Uh, there's a guy in Auckland called Simon Young. I'm uh, from TradeMe, and I'm the head of product development there. Um, and we're facilitating this session uh, sort of in our capacity as, as TradeMe uh, representatives, but, but not really. So. Um, feel free to, to ask us anything about trade me and we will try to answer if we can. But this is a session for all of us to chat about the issues, so um, it's not about us talking to you for uh, an hour, it's really uh, to get some conversation started. And we've got a few questions that we put uh, in the brief that we can um, go back to if you want to have a, 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 some, some anchor points for this. Um, and just to recap quickly what they are, um, we were talking about the, the digital wake that we generate as we move about business online. Um, and so what, as an online business, Martin, welcome. Hi, have you started? We were just killing time until you got here. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> uh, so what responsibilities do we have, as businesses have to safeguard that wake that we leave behind us as we, as we move around? Um, also, what practices should we, as custodians of that data, um, put in place to make sure that it's um, secure and private and, and uh, it, it's, it's handled in a way that you would expect? Um, we're also talking about personalization. Uh, it's a big thing for us in a product uh, space. When does that become creepy and when is it uh, good for the consumer? And then as a society, what should we demand of the likes of the trade me's and, and the Facebooks and the others around the, the, the world uh, and when it comes to handling our data and uh, the data of our families and our, our friends and, and colleagues and things. So just some ideas to get the, the, the ball rolling. Um, and so let me introduce my, um, my learned colleague here, uh, Marissa. So Marissa, do you want to? Thanks. I'm in. So I'm Marissa, I work in the legal and regulatory team at, at TradeMe and one of, the, one of my roles there is also to, to be privacy officer and we've got a guy who's also another privacy officer for TradeMe and part of what we do within the, the legal team is that we advise the company on all sorts of legal issues and privacy is one of those, those issues and also in our role, we, we draft the privacy policies for our range of, of websites. And I've heard over the last couple of days that no one actually reads privacy policies. Great. Brenda reads privacy policies. <laughs> but um, we still, regardless, pull painstakingly over every single word that we might put in those privacy policies. Because as, as you're probably aware, it's our a legal, it's the legal framework that we, we need to adhere to and that under the Privacy Act we need to disclose what information we're collecting and the purpose that we're going to use that information for. So for example if um, Simon or you know one of the tech or product teams was developing a new product then we'll work closely with them and work out exactly what that service is that's going to be offered and whether there's going to be any further personal information that might be collected and then we will work to draft an appropriate um, inclusion for our privacy policy. So before we do that as well then we'll um, get uh, consent from our members so we'll provide notice to our members that we're changing that privacy policy and go out to them and, and get that consent. One of, the, um, one of the really cool things actually that the Privacy um, Commissioner's Office has, has worked on recently is the, the Privamatic tool and I'm sure someone from OPC might be able to give us a little bit more insight into the rationale for, for developing that but essentially the concept is that you, you enter in and Brenda developed it. Yes. <laughs> um, and Tim. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll hear from you guys later. But the, the general concept of that is to enable businesses to try and meet those privacy obligations. So you can go through the step by step process and put in exactly what information is being collected and how it's going to be used. And then at the end of it, it spits out this simplified, uh, well, it's a really concise, simple privacy policy, which is, which is brilliant for, for new startups who perhaps don't have any legal experience or legal expertise to rely on to, to actually develop 
that privacy policy. So it's a fabulous um, little tool that's just been put out. Um, Privamatic. P R I V dash O dash M A T I C. Yeah. Yes. Sure, yeah. Thanks, James. That's a good point. Um, so the collaborative notes are on the Google Docs, which is linked from the web page, the NetWeb page. So have a, have a look on there and feel free to add, edit, um, and uh, get involved there as well. I'll bring the mic around in a second. Um, did you want anything else? Yeah, I was just going to add that when I was talking to Brenda before, that she mentioned that um, a lot of that wording was actually developed by a non-lawyer, which, which is great. Because that's one of the um, one of the things that we try and keep in mind when we're drafting these privacy policies is to make sure that it's easy to read and user friendly. And often um, lawyers can get in the way of making something easy to read because they put all legal jargon around it. Uh, I was going to say, on the flip side of that, as a developer, um, we tend to just want all of the data all of the time for no good reason, and we go in with a very broad um, accept all policy for building stuff because it's easier. And so the, the things like the pragmatic and just having good, smart people who know this stuff is a really useful um, uh, gatekeeper, I suppose, before you go live to make sure that you're only getting the data you need and you have a good reason for capturing it and storing it and all that good stuff. Um, we talked, uh, some people might have been in the room yesterday for the Internet of Things session and we got probably halfway through that session and we had sp spent most of it talking about privacy, which was great. Um, that's probably uh, a good a good uh, thing to continue that conversation here rather than talking about you know beacons and devices like we did yesterday. So we can carry that on. But one of the um, conversations that happened afterwards that I was involved in was around um, Kickstarter and things like that where you are effectively backing a, a product that doesn't necessarily have privacy as its main feature that you're backing. So you, you, know, you put down $100 to say, I would love it for my smoke alarm to be able to tell me if it's um, burning in my house. But you don't have, um, you don't put $100 down to say, provided that data is stored uh, only within my premises and accessible um, to me only and with this sort of encryption, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, it's usually stored on a server somewhere in the States that you have no control over. So uh, that's an interesting aspect to kind of where we're coming from, from a, a privacy and a product point of view. And that's, that's sort of the stuff we were speaking to. So do you want to add anything else, Marissa? We'll go to the floor. Do anyone have any initial comments and questions? So questions are fine, comments are fine. Um, just keep them brief. Yep. So there's still on. Um, so uh, there's the generally the privacy guidelines which you would have for um, providing users enough information about how their data is being collected um, and perhaps the use of that. But I guess I wonder if there's technical guidelines for privacy which are probably um, almost as important because quite often, um, being from more the technical perspective, you get clients who don't start out with the privacy guidelines. They start out with saying they want to have these features which require almost a lot of user data being collected as well. So it's kind of like a developer approach where all data is generally wanted by the client as well. And then the developer themselves tends to implement that without guidelines on how safe the storage is or how secure that storage is as well. So you, it kind of also falls a little bit into security. But I'm wondering if there's a guidelines for that because, I mean, you still get cases today where databases will store the user's email and password in plain text and the plain text passwords is something that's so common now that it should always be encrypted but it's I guess still a guideline that perhaps needs to enter in the technical side of things as well. Does anyone have any thought on on that the sort of the technical standards around privacy? Sorry just to clarify when you um, when you're storing passwords they should not just be encrypted but non-reversibly encrypted. Um, which is quite a big difference. But, I mean, even if having like text, I guess, is... It should be a basic level of no-no. No one should ever see that. No one should ever have access to that. But obviously, down the line, several companies or clients have said that it's not important enough and shouldn't be developed for. And what I'm imagining is perhaps that the technical guidelines for privacy should become more apparent in the community. It should be more readily known. It should be almost a basic level of training that we need. 
um, and maybe that step isn't being included for, say, many DBA admins or anything like that. It's not even registered quite often as being a standard or requirement. Same thing with usernames. I, my experience is it's common for DBAs to encrypt passwords, um, but they use it in a, a reversible mode so that they can still get that back. So you haven't actually really restricted anyone uh, access, but those people already had access to the database anyway. So what have you gained? Do you actually need to specify that non-reversible part? Um, and ideally, use a directory service. Don't use a database. Well, what I'm saying is yeah. that these occurrences still occur. Are there guidelines that are available for education on these? Because that we know that the case is that they are insecure, that the technical guidelines are not being followed. But unlike uh, the OWASP top 10, this set of guidelines for privacy isn't in a base forum somewhere that people can just pick up, or that is sort of such common knowledge and training. Um, quite often for the technical side, there's just no base level that everyone is being picked up that they need to follow for every client project. It's kind of it's like security sometimes. It's left to last. So I might, I might throw that to the team from the OPC if you had any comments, Tim, maybe on, on, on that, the technical guidance around how, how privacy should be technically maintained. Yeah, um, unfortunately, in terms of technical guidelines, no, uh, not, not from our office at least, and that's largely because privacy is different between cultures, between countries. Um, so there isn't anything like the, the DSD top four or the, the OWASP top ten that, that we can point people towards. We do do that regularly um, when we're talking about the, the security element of privacy. But um, what we look for in terms of design of technology and tools is privacy by design, and that's making sure there's someone in the room very early on and says, hey, there is personal information involved. We do need to have a think about this and we provide guidance for, for how to think through those information flows and maybe where the risks are and what sort of mitigations you should be looking for. Um, and, and we're also, we've got a policy team in our office that, that sits down and we work through those issues with people where it does get complex. But um, we're always on the lookout for opportunities to make privacy easy. Um, and if that's a thing that communities need, we're we're happy to look into to putting something like that together. So, yeah. Guy. Oh, are you? Yeah. Any other questions or comments on that, or any of the other? Go for it. I'll, ch I'll chip in, seeing as no one else put their hand up. Is that is that sort of privacy by, by design <laughs> stuff part of the training of, of of developers at any stage, or does that not come until you hit the job, and someone says, no, that's not how we do things around here. Um, is that? I mean, and and if not, should should it be? So I think security uh, is definitely part of it, and increasingly so. And there is an overlap between security and and uh, privacy. Obviously, the, the the encryption aspects of of password storage, and also how you access uh, data that is stored in the database, particularly. Um, as far as privacy goes, no, I mean the the lack of the, the OWASP top ten from a security point of view is is kind of a a, go a bit of a gospel from from that point of view. But because there's no privacy technical standards that we're sort of referring to here. Um, it's sort of a bit of ad, ad hoc, on the job, don't do that, code review, peers, seniors, that sort of thing, doing that, that stuff. Um, in my experience, at least anyway, I'd be interested in, in others uh, of a technical bend in the room who might have uh, different or, or corroborating stories. I'm, I'm curious, how, how many people have read the Privacy Act? I'm not including lawyers, sorry. <laughs> oh, you can, you can put your hand up if you're a lawyer. You're welcome. So not, not that many. I mean, I had to read it. I'm not a lawyer. I don't have the training background. And it actually read quite well, apart from the bit with unique identifiers, which confused the heck out of me. Thank you, Tim, for spending ages. And everyone else um, as well. Yeah, it, no one really <laughs> understood it. And then we tried to turn it into plain English, and it took about 15 goes to rewrite it so that yeah. we can get it there. And it's still a little confusing. Um, but yeah, so if we can't even understand the act, we, we yeah. I think that's actually a really important point because um, largely, like we were saying before, pretty much no one reads privacy policies. So then it comes down to the trust that people have in an online business or platform. So that's really integral to um, ensuring that people actually trust you to to give you well trust the online uh, business to to 
receive and hold on to those email addresses. Um, so, yeah, interested in other people's thoughts on, on Brenda's comments as well. Hi, my name's uh, Hemi, B Hemi Bennett. Uh, I've got my own online business, uh, afterdarkdesignmedia.com. Um, yeah, I've been developing software for quite a while. Uh, security, um, I've been writing software about 27 years. Uh, we've always built software uh, security in there all the time. Security's a big issue for me. Uh, they're, they're cutting code now. And, you know, the common problems like password, you know, and using the word QWERTY and stuff like that as passwords and, you know, um, what's the other QWERTY, HDF, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and people's, um, people use, using that, oh, password 1, password 99, you know, all the usual stuff. Now, there's software out there now that has just doubled in terms of uh, keyboard taps, in terms of uh, password um, uh, crack, uh, cracking. So, yeah, uh, now these machines are extremely fast. This software, the software stuff is real fast. So, a 13-letter password is no longer good anymore. You guys got to start changing your passwords and start using poems, okay? Or I don't know, a sentence. The quick brown fox jumped over a lazy dog. Yeah, use that one. Don't use that one. You can't use that one now. And then I'll crack you. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, I mean, I'm just putting it out. there's a really good overlap between privacy and security, and I think we, we could go down the security angle for a, a long time, and that's that's fine if, if you'd like to. Um, uh, there's certainly uh, varying degrees of practices. Using a directory is obviously you know a centralised source. A lot of people are these days just using email as a sign-on um, uh, mechanism. So there's no password. You just use your email, and you trust in the security of your email system. Um, Often that's that's the the backup anyway because um, many times you can retrieve a forgotten password through your email so that's sort of the the weakest or the strongest link if you like in, in that sort of uh, password ecosystem. Um, I don't know how much more you want to talk about that, but we, we can for a long time. Um, I'm also interested in the sort of the pri privacy aspect. So, given that you are generating a bunch of data that is being stored against you personally. Um, and maybe not accessible to you, and may not even be uh, you be aware of that stuff being stored. What, what does that mean? How, how do we have any obligation as a business or as a society to uh, do something about that and, and jump up and down about it? And, and if so, what? There was a question or a statement. Here. I had a, a different comment actually, sure. rather than that. Um, it was more about it's the, going back to the passwords thing. It's not just about having a password that lets the user access their data. There's also considerations of how the organisation handles that data. How does it store it? Where does it where does it back it up to? Are those backup tapes that they send off site to some random Iron Mountain or whoever are they encrypted against that company? When the when you send the data over the internet, are you making sure that that is it's encrypted in flight over the internet? Um, and a lot of people get stuck at the first hurdle of the passwords, but there's actually many more aspects to it that you've got to think about um, when you're handling big chunks of people's personal data. Yeah. Um, so uh, correct me, lawyers, if I'm wrong here, but I learnt that they're not required to tell you that they will sec keep it securely and in, in a manner, and they're not required to tell you how they'll destroy it. Those are optional in the tool that Privacy Commission helped me build. Um, so you have no idea if they're just going to keep it on a piece of paper on a street corner somewhere. It, 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 they don't tell you. Yeah, um, what, what Marissa was talking about earlier in terms of the, the privacy policies or the privacy statements, um, that is a very clear set of expectations and that doesn't include security and, and that doesn't include retention. Um, there are still obligations on the business to secure that information and only keep it for as long as they need. And in terms of as long as they need, that's actually for the purpose they collected it for, not just you know lock it in a cupboard until they work out what to do with it. So um, yeah, there, there, there are still obligations, but mm. yeah, they don't have to tell you, but it, we, we definitely recommend that businesses tell their users what's going on, because it's, it's a two-way thing, it's about transparency. and. Mm. And you can't really give consent if you don't understand what's going on with your information. Um, we keep using this word consent. Um, I, I don't use Facebook because I can't agree to the Privacy Commission. Oh, sorry, sorry, Privacy Statement. Get my words mixed up. I can't agree with it, and the reasons I can't agree with it, I'd like to keep those private too. Um, which means that I miss out on other things. Um, so, okay, I, I'm missing out. Um, another one would be my employer uses the Google Mail in the cloud, so. 
what, what do I do? Refuse to read my email at my job every day? No, I have to agree to the privacy statement that they're tracking where my mouse moves every day while I've got a Google thing open. It, it's, it's not really consent. It's, it's just, inf just being informed is what privacy statements mean to me these days. Um, or you'll miss out on updates from grandma on Facebook. Actually, we had a question in the back row or the middle row there. Uh, thank you. Um, my name's Emma Pond. I'm a lawyer that works in privacy a lot. Um, I just thought I'd throw it out there that there's a, quite a lot of discussion going on overseas about whether this form of notice and consent for privacy acceptance is dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sort of there's a lot of discussion more around putting obligations on businesses around ethical use and fairness, whatever they may mean. That's the, the hard question, I suppose. But that's, I think, maybe the future. Because, as you say, nobody reads privacy policies, nobody reads them, mm -hmm. and even if you disagree with them, you don't really get an opt-out option if mm -hmm. you want to use the product. So. In, the, in the brief uh, for this session, I cheekily put in uh, the sentence, what will you give me for my email address is the opening um, line there. And I, hands up in the room if you've put your email address into a form in order to be told about a service that hasn't yet launched that you might want to find out about. Yeah, did you read the privacy policy before you did that? A couple of people, I didn't. So I think there's, there's, there's a very low value that we place on that data. And I think a lot of the, to your point, Brenda, there's a, a sort of a, a threshold of maybe ap apathy, I don't know what it is, but um, people just don't necessarily care about that stuff too much. And people use Facebook potentially without thinking about the privacy concerns that, that some people might. And so I think there's just a, a range of tolerances that people have to uh, give out that personal data. And we know from those kinds of services where it's just give me an email address and I'll email you when this thing's ready that you've never heard of before, it's a very low tolerance. So that's, yeah. yeah. Um, a good way of dealing with that is use a different email address for every single service and then you find out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm Lucy, I'm from Wellington, I'm another one of these lawyery types. Um, I think one of the issues that I have in the privacy space and business online is that people don't really know what the boundaries of personal information is, and as individuals a lot of people muddle their own personal closely held company with actually their own personal interests. Um, and for me, in terms of business online, where a lot of our clients and people face issues is actually when they're small businesses that at a personal level they feel deeply connected with. Um, but from the privacy officer's perspective or the privacy commissioner, it's not, if it's business information, it's not personal information. So at least with privacy and online and personal information, you actually have good recourse to a free government paid agency that will help you. But if you're talking about information about you know, the income that your closely held business, for example, has earned, you don't. You're stuck in this land of breach of confidence or something else, um, and expensive court processes and dispute pr tribunals. So one of the issues for me, I think, is to really look closely at what do we even mean by personal information and how far does that go because um, some people wouldn't consider where their mouse is tracking on the screen as even information about them, whereas others, others do. That's an interesting point um, around what exactly is personal information. And obviously we can recite off, you know, it's anything about an identifiable individual. But maybe I'd look to Tim again about um, questions which OPC receive around um, people coming to you and saying, hey, how do I work out if this is actually personal information or not, and what tips that you might have, um, practical tips in, in helping them make their assessment? Yeah, um, I'll try, and, and I might also throw it to some other OPC colleagues that we've got in the room. There they are, they're, they're Sorry, Sarah and you. Tony, they're over there. If you, um, <laughs> if you take all the OPC people away, they'll throw them Yeah, on the... the the borders between um, business information and, and personal information. We, we definitely do recognise as an office that, that there is personal information tied up in that kind of sole trader. Um, you know, it, it is your personal income. Um, and, and often people talk about data sets, like full business data sets. And it's like, oh, it's just business information. We can do whatever we want with it. Um, we, we do recognise that there is personal information tied up in that, and we do advocate that agencies look after that, that information responsibly. Um, they, 
The way businesses work in New Zealand, they tend to try and do that anyway. They, they protect their, their business information a bit more securely than personal information sometimes. Do you have any um, powers to enforce that though? Um, it depends what you mean by powers. Um, we, yeah, we 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 don't go around finding people, um, but we we do uh, we do have an investigative um, ability. So if someone complains to us, we will investigate that. If we think it's serious enough, we don't even have to wait for a complaint, and we can compel information um, out of agencies. Uh, we we do have the power to do that. Um, if a business or a person doesn't agree with our view on something, that can go up to the Human Rights Review Tribunal and they can award fines, but in terms of our powers around that, it's... Um, I work on the policy side. We largely try and stay helpful rather than um, <laughs> grumpy. So, yeah. <laughs> Hello, hear me again. Uh, yeah, I'm actually an ex-IBMer as well. And so, uh, uh, for me, businesses, uh, if they're holding on to my data, they better look after it, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's my personal information, and I've given it to them. And if they don't look after it, watch out, as, as far as I'm concerned. Because when I give, give a business my information, my email system and stuff like that, they better make, make sure my stuff's secure. I use Gmail, I haven't got a problem with it. I'm actually a boring watch. So, yeah, watch me Google. <laughs> uh, James? Okay. So, uh, James Minton at New Zealand, and I, one of the things in my bag of projects is potential privacy law reform. Um, a couple of things I'd like to hear about from this room is whether it would be possible to have privacy statements that operate in a way that's as simple as Creative Commons licenses. So an organisation could say, we are privacy one, privacy B, or whatever it is, and, and so there's a standard for what they do with information. Another thing that's, that overlaps with security is breach notifications, because organisations hold information, and as I understand the privacy principles, an organisation, they're obliged to protect your data, but if there's a security breach, there's no explicit requirement they have to tell you what's happened, where it's gone. Hello, so as Tim helpfully pointed out, I'm <laughs> Sarah and I'm also from the OPC. I thought I'd just pick up your breach notifications comment because that's a piece of work I'm doing at the moment. I actually, I used to be in the investigations team, so I was one of the grumpy people Tim was talking about, but I've made, I've seen the light and I've, the air of my ways, I'm now in the policy team, so I've become a friendly, helpful person if you want to come talk to me. Um, so breach notification, yeah, absolutely, at the moment, it's basically dealt with as a creature of our own creation. There's nothing explicit in the act about breach notification. There's absolutely no requir requirement for you or agencies to tell people if they have been the subject of a data breach. But we have certainly seen over the last few years, internationally and particularly in New Zealand, um, I think the ACC data breach probably was when we saw a really sharp increase in this happening. Agencies are voluntarily telling us and getting us involved, not always necessarily telling the people involved, and that's actually something we, there are sometimes really good reasons why you wouldn't tell the individuals. Um, but we've got uh, data breach guidelines which have seen a really good uptake. But that is something really to keep an eye on in the future space because that will be being implemented in the new Privacy Act whenever that does come through. The, the government has indicated they will be introducing mandatory breach notification. So that will be if you reach a certain threshold, agencies have to tell us at least. And in more serious cases, they will be required to tell their clients as well. So that's a on the horizon, and that's the bit of work I'm doing now, is working out how we're going to be handling all of those. But. And if I could pick up the other thread um, of that question, because I don't want that to drop, I would love to see uh, licenses, you know, A, B, C, D, um, of for privacy that, that we can use. Um, I would um, uh, 
really one of the reasons is it would save on lawyer's fees so we don't have to get these things rewritten every time we start a new company or whatever. Um, but unfortunately I get the feeling that it'll keep going, it'll be E, F and then it'll be F subcategory U, um, which would be the one that most of these companies choose because there really is a genuine trade-off between privacy and, um, and being able to be useful for your customer. And and I'd, I'd push back also on the, on the business information. I want that business information to be publicly available. I want to be able to look at the, what charities, for example, are doing and what foreign companies that are owned are doing in New Zealand and, and, the, and their, their money. I want to see who the directors are, who the shareholders are of those companies. I think it's our right as an open society to be able to see that, to see where the money's flowing and so on. So I, th I find it a very, very useful thing to do and so do journalists. So just a bit of a plug for that end of the, of the equation too. Sure, do we had a question? A lot of hands on that one. If it's helpful, there are some certifications that are starting to surface internationally. So, for example, trustee.com has a variety of certifications. One of them is an enterprise privacy certificate, which says that you meet EU safe harbour, APEC, FIPs, OECD and GAP requirements. There's also some copper standards, um, kids' privacy assessment, European privacy advertising certification. So there's, there's a growing list um, and trustee.com certificates are starting to be seen on a number of cloud-based apps. Um, so, but I don't, they're way off the Creative Commons situation. In terms of the business point, if, can I just clarify? I'll give an example. So there's one, um, there's one case note on the privacy officer's website where a husband and wife real estate agent team complained that their um, annual income was disclosed at a national broadcast and the real estate company said, no, we didn't disclose your income, we just disclosed what the South Island branch Hokitika company earned for the year. And they're like, well, there's two people that basically <laughs> disclosed our income. And the Privacy Commissioner said, we can't investigate that. That's business information, not personal information. So that's sort of the type of thing that I'm talking about where it's one step removed. Absolutely, companies' office registers, companies' directors' registers are a public register. There's separate principles in the Privacy Act around public registers, which is separate from the information privacy principles. Um, land transfer records, for example, are also public registers. So I'm not, I'm, I wasn't meaning to talk about that sort of um, corporate information. I'm talking about that, that closely held things like the husband and wife company, that there's a disclosure of what their income is or what their assets are. Thanks for that. The, the two uh, two comments. One is that trustee, if it's the same trustee I'm thinking of, has been around since 99 or something. Is that the same people? Yep. And, uh, and I was in the States when they were founded and, was, and I wrote about them even in, in, internally in the consulting firm I was working for. And um, it's, it's, it became a bit of a joke because they put the certificate on and it was almost like, all right, I don't trust those guys because, uh, it, it, because it was, it was a, a bit of... Uh, well, that's what they say they do. Um, well, do they actually do that one? And the, and the certificates are so broad that they could do anything they liked. Um, so for me, that that brand lost its value years ago. So, uh, and the the second one, I I I do sense that there was a moral wrong in that um, in that case. Um, but business is business, and so there should have been a non-disclosure agreement, a confidentiality agreement between the various branches of that business. And if there wasn't, well, you're adults doing business together. So I'm thinking my own circumstance, I know a lot of information that I may or may not allow to be public, um, and I'm bound by contracts with each of the companies that I deal with, uh, and that's how business works. Guy, did you have a comment? Yeah. Just coming back to the simplifying privacy policy things and the Creative Commons license analogy, it, it, it's a difficult comparison because your Creative Commons license really only deals with the one thing. It says you can have this thing and you can make money out of it, not make money out of it, make some money out of it. It's, a it's, a it's really just dealing with a one, one aspect. And what that licence doesn't do is tell you what the thing is, and that's what your privacy policy sort of has to do. It has to tell you all of the things that are being collected, and there is an enormous amount of detail that goes into it in order to be transparent. And if you're going to simplify, you have to accept the trade-off of clarity. And I think that's one of the things that, that, that we all wrestle with who, who do this day to day, uh, and not to blow fees out, but to how, how to balance um, clarity against against honesty, I guess. Um, I, I actually think our Privacy Act is out of date, in a sense that a lot of the things that 
that we do could be sucked out into base legislation, and that would have the effect of, of simplifying privacy policies. I think if if, um, if the obligations around um, you know, data erasure and storage and sorts of things were, were statutory baselines or regulatory baselines, we wouldn't have to talk about them in privacy policies, and privacy policies could be simplified right back to what information do you have about me, what are you using it for, which really are, the, I think, the key things that, that consumers are interested in. Yeah, hear me, grumpy security programmer. Um, <coughs> yeah, no, the com company's office, if you want to find out any um, company information, director information, that's the best place to go. Um, I want to go back to the dude with the glasses, back here's uh, thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we should have something like the SSL layer, you know, uh, uh, securities uh, socket layer, you know, um, um, and uh, uh, HTTPS sort of security um, acronym at the front and for the pr protocols and stuff. So, yeah, there should be some kind of SSL certificate, certificate you can purchase that will have that um, privacy stuff. And, and, there is and, the P3 and, and policy, which is a semi-standard that's applied by um, likes of Google when they... When they do ranking. Um, if you want from Google here, they can correct me. But well, well, you know, I mean, uh, you know, there's ISO stuff out there too. Yep. So I mean, um, you know, probably ISO is probably the best way to, to do anything. You know, ISO ISO nine thousand stuff. So yep. yeah, yeah. Cheers. Cool. I think Martin had a comment. Yeah. Yes, hello, Mark Hi. from NetSafe. Uh, I did have a comment. Uh, I'm now going back about 20 minutes, actually, to when it came up. Uh, and so, you know, maybe you want to park this and carry on that. But um, there was that uh, user apathy thing. So partly, you know, like we're here and we're saying, oh, should we simplify privacy and make it into, you know, Creative Commons and standards or whatever. But the truth is most people don't give a shit. Uh, most people don't care uh, about the privacy things that they, that they sign. And the reason is because they don't feel as though there's any harm in, in signing those things. Now, uh, Brenda, you're expert in this kind of stuff, and so you look through the Facebook thing, but, okay, has anybody been harmed by privacy breaches on Facebook? No. Do people feel as though they've been harmed? Sorry, so, so, phrase it slightly differently. Do consumers feel as though they've been harmed? Do they? Is the average one? Okay, cool. I actually think um, I think you made a fundamental mistake there, Martin. I, I don't I don't think what you're um, seeing in people is apathy. I think what you're seeing is helplessness. They they don't. It's not they don't care. It's they don't feel that they can do make any difference. So they just click accept to get access to the service. Um, they don't they don't feel that there's anything that they can manifestly do. And there have been studies. Um, there's a guy called Alessandro Acquisti who um, spoke at the privacy. Uh, what was it? The digital identity, identity conference, conference at um, at uh, to Papa a, a few weeks ago, and he, he's studied extensively um, what what triggers people to to um, make decisions about privacy, and and what what you see is not is not I don't care, have my information go nuts, just give me access to the service. What you see is why why would I pay attention to that? I can't I can't change it. I have to either take the service or leave it. So I ne I need the service, so I'm going to take it. Um, and it's it's not that people don't give a shit; it's that they just can't make any me meaningful difference. Question over the back from a gentleman. Hi, yeah, thanks. Look, I think both of those points are actually reconcilable. Both of those points are reconcilable, and it's a very good point. I, I write a, I'm in charge of a system that is used exclusively by lawyers in New Zealand, an online system. And one of the things we look at is obviously when they log in, they need to tick the terms and conditions. And we, we've got all the metrics on that, of course. And it takes about one second for these lawyers to read the terms and conditions, apparently. They read really, really quickly. Um, and so it, it's just an interesting, interesting example that I think both the points uh, are correct. In some cases, people may feel, well, I'm not going to be able to negotiate these terms and conditions, so I've got to accept them. Um, why bother reading them? Or I don't really care. I've, I've, you know, every, every single time I log into a website or I do anything, I've got to just, you know, tick accept. It's sort of rather like the EU cookies, you know, thing that drops down your screen now, saying, "Oh, was it right?" It's like you're almost like instinctively, "Yes." Oh, what was that? Oh, that must have been the cookies thing, you know. Um, so there is a huge degree of apathy, um, and also a huge degree of, if you like, um, 
uh, helplessness to some extent. And this really reflects the tension. I think that Simon mentioned it right at the outset. You know, we're in a bit of an invidious position because developers are trying to create as useful systems as possible. All these wonderful features, all these great apps that can predict what you're going to do based on all information, you're going to store that. Then you've got terms and conditions and lawyers who try and basically make you sign away all of your rights the moment you want to log in and, and, and use a system. Then you've got users who don't really care or feel helpless and, and don't you know, bother doing it anyway. So we're sort of in this perfect storm of um, uh, trampling on privacy, if you like, or, or minimizing it. And it's only when something actually goes wrong, then you say, oh, I'm not happy about that thing that happened, even though by that time you've signed away all of your rights, or your data is out of New Zealand. I mean, we're talking about New Zealand law and the New Zealand Privacy Act and so on. Um, well, none of that really is applicable to when you use Facebook or any Google service and you've signed and committed to all of Google's terms and conditions. So we are in a bit of a perfect storm, and I completely agree and very pleased to hear comments that law reform is, is uh, on the table and, and there's some recognition that needs to happen. My final comment um, is, of course, on that point that the Privacy Act, uh, I, I agree, it needs reform and it's, it's, it's out of date. Having said that, though, it's done remarkably well. It was, it was effectively pre-internet, well, it was not pre-internet, but 1993, pre-Facebook, pre-Google, pre all those things. Um, so it's done well to sort of make it to where it is. but. You can imagine if we were writing a privacy act today, knowing how Facebook works, knowing how all these things work, I imagine we come up with something very different. So, coming down here, and then we've got I've had more than my turn, so I'll be quiet. But just just to that point, it's it's um it's hard to reconcile the if we were writing the privacy act today, we'd write it totally different with the hey, it's actually been pretty good kind of argument. It's been yeah, it has. Sorry, I should shut up. Okay, sorry, another lawyer, um, but I just wanted to give <laughs> a perspective of some of the protections that you actually have. The f first off, um, I, I don't think that when lawyers write these things, they try and get people to give away as many rights as they can. I, I work for, I guess, mainly government agencies, but I know whenever I write privacy policies for them, there's actually a lot of thought goes into how do we write this just so that we get enough um, rights to do what we with, with the information that we really need and and no more the the second protection is um, the the legal one under the unfair contract terms act so if the, the privacy policies are incorporated into contracts so if there was anything um, unfair in the legal sense in that policy at least if it was in, tried to be enforced in New Zealand you couldn't un enforce it um, in terms of the, the, the rights that, that were given. Um, and the third protection, I guess, is really just the community. Um, and as individuals, we may not read these policies, but there you can bet that somewhere in the world someone will have read it, and if they found it really objectionable, they, they would have posted that. Look, there was a, a, a comment that came through on the NetHui voice uh, hashtag, which I'll, I'll, I'll raise as well for discussion, which is, um, I'll quote, what, what about the way Gen Y people like myself don't seem to care about their privacy when they should? So is there a um, generational aspect to this as well where notwithstanding the, the, the lack of potential ability to do anything about it or the, you know, the not giving a shit uh, aspect, um, is there also a generational thing in there as well? Yeah, I, Sorry, I was going to say that there have been cases where websites have changed their terms and conditions and users of the website have um, noticed that the change now gives that company the right to reuse all the content that the users have loaded and the users, once it becomes public, have flocked away from that system. Um, and that's happened on quite a few occasions now. So there is a, a, a communal aspect to monitoring the, sure. what they do. I've, I've got to say that um, listening to all these discussions back and forth is really interesting as a general standard user of the internet and all things and having someone who I'm trying to bring up to look after her own self in every way, it's really difficult because as well as all these other aspects when it comes to pushing the AI, except there's absolute laziness that comes into it as well. If these policies were clear, simple and easy done, A, B, C, D and E, like when you go to a restaurant, that makes things easier and it's easier to make an informed choice. We're not making informed choices about these things. We're simply going, I want to use this, I want this program, I want whatever it is. School says I need to have this for her to do her lessons and that's what we're going to do. But at the same time, what we're actually doing is we're teaching our children to just do that because that's what they're seeing. And so all of this means that we are actually 
putting them into a vulnerable position by our own actions because we have no way of changing it. Yeah, and that's where it's up to you lot to come up with a way. Keeping it simple, only gain the information that you absolutely need. You don't need everybody's details down to what they had to breakfast this morning. That's totally irrelevant and unimportant. And the protection and honesty, openness. I know that as uh, I was a chair for Linux conference that happened here in Auckland this year, as a part of the information that we gathered of our delegates, it was, the rule was you only gain the information that you absolutely need. There was a data breach of our database uh, about a month or so after our conference. Soon as the people who look after the database found out about it, they revealed that information to everybody and told them the steps that they were taking. They are completely open, the database is still down. They haven't actually managed to sort it out. But that information is still there for people to see. The openness, the honesty, and only having the information you absolutely need is what's really important. Giving us a chance to actually make some good choices for our children. There's a couple of comments on that subject, I think. Brenda, you wanted to respond to the generational issue? Um, so apparently I'm Gen Y because I snuck in by a couple months. So as a really old Gen Yer, I have um, the following is my experience that you don't know in advance how much privacy you need. It's like insurance. I used to be um, maybe what you call a typical Gen Y. It was all online. What could go wrong? Uh, what could matter? Um, and you could find out a lot from me from a, a quick search. And I also contribute to open source. And these two intersected with someone who really hates women's names appearing in open source, decided to send me stuff that I won't describe here. All the things that, that could make me silence my contributions. They did, and they were quite successful for a few years. Um, and suddenly, all this, like, five, six years of my posting actually made me unsafe. And I, 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 there were lots of reasons why I moved house, but one of them was because a family member came to my sister's wedding and made a marker in Google Map of Brenda's house, made it as a public place because they didn't know how to use it. And there's no way to remove that. Even if you know 100 Google employees, they can't work out how to remove Brenda's house from the public Google Maps in Wellington. I don't live there anymore. Um, but this, this made me very unsafe um, with someone saying, how are they going to kill me? every week. So um, you don't know in advance what you need is my takeaway from this. And I think a subset of Gen Y are going to learn this the way I did. Sure. Just going to comment over this side. Um, um, I guess this is also in addition to um, what you say in that you need to be able to clearly identify um, the protections or application usage um, what data there is, but there's also the case for having an application that has variable controls on data use as well. So there'll be some things that they'll want to have. So having an application where you can switch off the sharing with certain other people, but still enable the use of an application to a certain degree. And it's one of those things where having that variable control on features or variable control on data use, because right now what you get, especially with mobile devices, and mobile privacies, quite often they will say, we need to use all your contacts, all your um, photos, everything like that. And it might just be something as simple as a note-taking app. Um, but regardless of that, if you just want to use the base features of that application, you'll still need to agree to the total list of available permissions that they can retrieve. So having the variable options are probably just as important um, for companies on that usage aspect. But then again, you still have the aspect that most users, I mean, even now, you still have heaps of studies showing that it's, it may not be laziness, it may not be that they feel powerless, but it also could be that there's not enough accessibility to the information around the privacy usage on those controls. Um, so sort of similar to the Microsoft um, user account control pop-ups, you know, not many people actually realize that those are color-coded for certain specific access. and when people will just say, continue, continue, keep on going. I, it, it's not something that they go, ah, this is the one I need to stop and make a pause at, because that, there's not that information there visible or easily accessible to the user to investigate on. There's no link on that user account control to go, oh, this is where I can go to find out information on the state. But I that's think, just, I guess, availability. Yeah, I, I think as technologists, there's a responsibility on us to understand privacy better as we're building systems. And a great example that you reminded me of then was when we released our Android app. We wanted it to be able to buzz in your pocket when you received a notification. And so the code that you write to 
get access to the, the, the vibration function happened to also include the permission to access the dialer. And so we got lots of feedback saying, why is Trade me trying to dial my phone? And we weren't, obviously. We just wanted to make it buzz for you so you could know pull your phone out of the pocket. But because those things were interlinked, some Android developer somewhere building that system didn't think that that would be a thing that would be a problem. Um, we, we, we suffered the result of that. So I think it's really important. One of the things I wanted just to steer towards, and Lance, I'll flick to you in a second, is um, in the brief we mentioned personalization and when does that become creepy? And I think the, the, the sort of subject when we're clicking through terms and conditions and accepting them, um, oftentimes we're not realizing what we're giving until we start to see that coming back at us later down the track. So the Facebook feed is an example, um, whereas for many people it might be useful, for some people that might feel creepy. And one of the things that we're, we're dealing with is to what degree can we show you back information that we know about you to help you get a better experience in the system versus too much that makes you feel like we've invaded some kind of bubble that we shouldn't have. So that's an interesting topic I don't want to throw in there for the last six minutes, but Lance had a comment. Just quickly, just to build on what you just said, the last two people, um, what I do when I'm confronted with one of these situations where they're asking what I feel is too much from me for my, from, versus the benefit of the application, and I'm completely unafraid, I'll go and give them a one-star review uh, on the App Store, and I'll say why. And because they read those, yep. and uh, and the, I've actually seen developers change uh, things as a result of giving them one-star reviews. You get enough of them, um, uh, you can actually have an impact. And that's exactly what happened in our Android app, by the way. We 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 were the ones that got the one star, and then we grumpily moaned through back channels to to, to the Android team, and and uh, but it was us that got the one star. So. Uh, that's me, uh, that's grumpy five uh, Tui. Um, anyway, there's a really good survey going around at the moment by a guy called Dr. Sividin Chastosiri. His name's Boom, I think. He's a. Uh, <laughs> ah. <laughs> he's in the, in the back row. Welcome. Yeah, Boom. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, he's doing some uh, security stuff with the uh, mobile devices and stuff, so I just suggest that you guys uh, support him in his um, survey. Uh, I'd say, problem. I've got a nine year old son, and this is his. Right. He's on Facebook and all that type of stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, he's on Facebook and all that type of stuff, and I've actually um, I've got to do the same thing, you know. And my son doesn't come with instructions, uh, and and he's got his own software, you know. So uh, yeah, and I don't know. The hardest thing for me is uh, I had to watch Tom's the Tank Engine for seven years. So yeah. So, uh, guys, we've got go. five more minutes, and I'm just conscious that we haven't heard from everybody in the room that might want to. So if you haven't spoken, then by all means, either chuck your hand up or make eye contact with, with me or one of the, the runners, and we'll, we'll get to you in the last five minutes. But in the, in the meantime, Tim? Um, I, I just wanted to make a, a quick plug for um, resources that might be useful. Um, the OWLS resource that we did with NetSafe. It's still up on your site, isn't it, Martin? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's useful information for, um, you know, teaching children about privacy. Um, and I, actually, I should just make a quick plug. There's a few of us from privacy with these handouts. Um, they've got information for, for education, for learning about privacy, for um, app developers. Um, all sorts. So th there are some resources out there um, not addressing kind of the very technical side of things. Um, that's something we're, we're looking out for, but definitely the only collect what you need. Um, look at how you deal with content on that small screen. Um, finding out where that creepy line is. Generally for us, it's people working in software and marketing, they, they don't aspire to megalomania. They just have really bright ideas and there aren't enough people around them to say, hang on, that's got personal information involved, you need to have a think about it. And, and what we want is, is more people to know that and know that we're available. So. Sure. Right. And we've got a comment down here um, on the end of that row. Uh, just no, on the, no. yep. Oh. Yeah, thanks. Hi, um, I'm a programmer, and um, just some things that I've noticed is um, um, it's very, um, when it comes to Google, Facebook, Instagram, people will easily agree to, uh, to use those services, and they will, you know, they'll happily let uh, Google collect all, uh, Google, Facebook, Instagram, even Twitter collect all your information. But when it comes to our small sites, and then they start thinking about privacy issues, and, and so that becomes a, pr a little bit of a problem. And then, and then I've also got um, 
um, I've got a five-year-old boy. Um, he picks up our, our phones. He likes to uh, use uh, watch YouTube cartoons on it. So I've had uh, the settings on YouTube so that it's you know child protected, so that he doesn't go into all the sites. But he picks up the laptop. He opens up Facebook, and on Facebook you have all these uh, these games that appear on the right-hand side, and he'll go and click on that without even realizing. So I have to tell him, no, those not those are not for little kids. Those are for mm -hmm. for adults. But you know it would be nice if they didn't have those games on the side, so that he doesn't go kicking on that. But I think there's a divide between um, um, when it comes to our small sites, people will, 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 will ask questions. They, they, they don't want to give all that information, but easily give it to Facebook, easily give it to Twitter, easily give it to Google because they, I mean, it's either that or you don't uh, use those services and everybody wants to use those services. So there's still a bit of a divide there. Thank you. There was one question in the back row here and I think that might be our last before we wrap. So, uh, I, yep, sorry, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, so I just uh, wanted to, I was trying to figure out what is this privacy thing. Uh, well, uh, finally, I think it boils down to information about you which might be harmful to you in some way, right? I mean, uh, we also want the opposite of privacy, right? We want people to know about us. That's why we go and put stuff on Facebook. So it's, it's not that we don't like people knowing about us. We do like that. Uh, and we do want people to know about us. But when it comes back to being harmful, uh, like her kids or his kid or even myself uh, or her former home, uh, whatever it is, then it becomes. And it's really difficult to figure out what could be harmful to me, uh, especially if I'm not the person who put it in. So if her brother-in-law, whoever it was, put information about her home, well, you know, she can't control it. Uh, and neither can Google because, well, it might yeah. not be Google, it might be something else. We're getting the angry Tui, right. I'm afraid. Right, so I think it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, did you want to quickly, just, just for 10 seconds, maybe make a point, sir? I'm, I'm conscious you haven't spoken yet. Yeah, hi. My, uh, my name's Chris. Um, I, I think there's some wonderful, nuanced and sophisticated privacy work going on within New Zealand. Um, I've got an app on my uh, Chrome which tells me uh, which countries I'm, I've been uh, searching. Uh, and um, bugger all are in New Zealand. Uh, that means that whenever I'm giving information, uh, it's going to be out of the jurisdiction uh, of the OPC. Uh, and that's a problem that I think uh, we're not really able to address uh, here. Uh, and it's an increasingly more difficult problem. And until you can find some way of enforcing privacy across borders, uh, all the good work you're doing is um, possibly uh, a waste of time. Great. Uh, thank you. Great point. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. If I, one thing to take away is just think about what we've talked about today. If there's anything that you can do in your own sphere to help progress these issues, either by continuing discussion or actually doing something active about them, then please, please do that. But thank you all for coming and appreciate the time.